Good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Butler. I'm from Amazon Web Services, and it's my pleasure to be here at NoSQL Now. And thank you for coming here to learn about um, analytics and running on DynamoDB, our no managed NoSQL offering. And so DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service, not an actual database application that you install, but it's a service, a managed service by Amazon that takes a lot of our uh, best practices and lessons learned in developing the Dynamo NoSQL technology. Um, that's just a, a screenshot of uh, the cover page of the white paper, our uh, Amazon.com CTO, uh, Werner Vogels, uh, that described that took the lessons from building the high-scale e-commerce platform and doing a key value pairs, and then also our lessons learned with developing Amazon Web Services, our cloud computing platform, and putting those together to come up with a managed NoSQL offering. And so DynamoDB is a regional service. If you're familiar with Amazon Web Services, we have the concept of regions, which are basically independent clouds throughout the world. We have nine regions. And so when Dynamo is deployed, it's deployed in a particular region, which is then divided up in multiple availability zones, which are physical data centers. And so when you launch a DynamoDB service, then you have uh, the ability of having this database service across multiple physical data centers, not just multiple instances, but across multiple data centers uh, on your behalf. And so when we do writes, uh, which are consistent writes, we make sure that it's in two physical data centers before we uh, send back a, a successful commit. So the reason why we want to uh, showcase DynamoDB is so you can focus on your applications or analytics platforms uh, running where the NoSQL part is managed on your behalf for you. So we'll go into that. It's a managed service, so you store and retrieve any amount of data, so there's no size limits in terms of total aggregate size. Uh, service any level of traffic, uh, reads and writes into the service, and then without any operational burden. And we'll talk about that by going through some of the things that Dynamo handles. Uh, the software, so there's no software to install and manage and patch and upgrade or purchase. It's all available as part of the service. Um, it scales without downtime, so if you need to increase the throughput capacity or decrease it, um, that happens without having to take the service offline and it automatically shards, and so it makes more and more partitions depending on the, number of, uh, the amount of throughput you need. So the greater amount of throughput that you need for reads and writes, it will automatically uh, determine the amount of partitions to uh, create to handle that uh, sustained load. And then automatic hardware failure. You don't have to worry about if a particular node goes down because the data is always redundant in multiple servers on multiple data centers. And uh, I already talked about the multi-AZ replication. And then the hardware is configured and designed specifically for providing this particular service. And we do the performance tuning. So the idea here is you need a place to put your data and take it out at any scale that you want, at any size that you want. And we take care of the operational burden in making that happen. So basically, it's the logical you turn the dial up or you turn it down depending on what you need, and you pay for the speed of throughput going in and out, as well as the, uh, uh, the amount of storage that you allocate uh, for the index. So it's for consistent, predictable performance. We get sub-millisecond uh, single-digit la uh, single latencies, so uh, less than uh, five, second for, um, five milliseconds for reads and less than 10 milliseconds for writes. And then there, it's backed on our uh, solid-state hard drives. It's a flexible data model, so key value pairs, key attribute pairs, no schemas required, and it's easy to create and easy to adjust. Um, the seamless scalability is you don't have to create ahead of time or think about ahead of time the size of your data. You can just start putting it in, and then you're charged accordingly per gigabyte per month on, on the actual size. And so it's unlimited storage. We'll get to some limits uh, in terms of the actual items that you're putting in, uh, but uh, in terms of aggregate storage, it's unlimited. And then durable. So it's consistent disk-only writes. It's not in memory. So once you get a commit that the write has happened, it's in multiple data centers. It's on hard drives. Um, and then the replication is taken care of. Uh, so when you put an item in, and we'll go through the nomenclature of DynamoDB, but when you put an item in and you get a positive response back, it's already done for you, so it's durable. 
Okay, so it's, we try to alleviate that operational burden off your hands. Take a look at an example of, you know, uh, Amazon.com traffic in November. That's where uh, Black Friday is happening uh, right after Thanksgiving. Um, you get this spike in terms of demand that's needed for database capacity, right? Um, when you aggregate all this usage per day, uh, we're only using 24% of the capacity that we've had. And so this gives you an example of pre-DynamoDB of, uh, of the elasticity problems that we have. So you, what you end up doing is you over-provision. You provision for a little bit of over-peak, right? This is much the same philosophy of uh, what we talk about with our cloud computing services. Now with Dynamo, when you have the actual traffic, you can provision Dynamo's throughput and size requirements um, more dynamically as you need, uh, need be. Another example, other than like Amazon.com retail, uh, when we were in beta with DynamoDB, uh, we have Amazon Cloud Drive. This is where it stores all the movies and videos and MP3s that you'll buy um, off of Amazon.com store. And so what happens is we store all the metadata in DynamoDB and the actual video files are then stored in S3. And that's a common design pattern when you wanna have large amounts of data you put those objects or blobs into S3 or durable storage of 11.9's durability, but then all the metadata about what that file is, what the file name is, any other attribute that you want to know of that file, uh, then that's stored in DynamoDB for fast lookups and retrievals. So um, three, de three decisions and, and five clicks, and we'll kind of go through the wizard. Uh, I got some screenshots of how you would create a table to get an idea. Um, and then we'll talk about the three decisions that you'd have to make when you want to have Dynamo. So let's assume that you've already decided that you want to try Dynamo. Now let's think about what do you need uh, to get started. All right, so we'll talk about the primary keys and then uh, decide if our, uh, we just released this a few months ago, the optional local secondary indices or indexes, uh, and then the provision level of throughput for reads and writes. So given an example here, so you have uh, a, 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 what we call a table, DynamoDB table, and then each row would be called an item, right? And you can have unlimited number of items in a table. And then the item, would have, and we'll talk about the primary keys, but an item will have a series of key value pairs, and the primary key of what it's indexed on is called the hash key, okay? You can have a cache key as a single attribute, key value pair, or you can do a composite uh, primary key, which we call a, range, a hash and a range key, so you can subdivide. And then you have multiple, uh, one to, uh, zero to many other key value attributes, as many as you need, and that's flexible. Uh, the t data types are strings or, or numbers, or an array of strings and an array of numbers. So uh, that's pretty much, pretty, uh, pretty much it for the Dynamo uh, DB table. You've got a table, a bunch of items, and we'll go through some of the steps. And then you have a primary key, and that primary key can be either just a hash, one key value pair, or a composite, which is the primary key plus the range key together as your primary. Uh, if you decide to do that composite, then you get access to the query API, then you can do a couple more additional filterings uh, and conditional predicates on the data, okay? So that's it in a nutshell. And then, then you have items, and this can be one to many, and we'll have some examples, uh, more examples. Okay, so indexed by the primary key, we got the single hash, and composite keys. And so when you think about database uh, operations uh, for making that translation to DynamoDB, it's just a bunch of reads and writes. So if you want a read, normal read, that's one read from Dynamo. If you want an update, you read, you make an update, write, and then read to double check, and then insert one write. And then the provision throughput. And so what we try to do is now we basically offer you a pipe, a number of what we call read and write capacity units, and I'll, I'll get into that. But we allow that amount, up to that amount, uh, for you to push data in or retrieve it out for Dynamo. That's basically the, the dial. So the more writes you want, you turn up that value, uh, or if you want to turn it down. Okay, we'll talk about some ways you can uh, have multiple tables and have different values for different tables based on your, on your workload. Okay, and so it's price per hour 
based on the provision throughput that you uh, require. Okay, so for provision throughput, uh, we, we separate the writes and reads, and then the writes are based on uh, up to one kilobyte uh, uh, per write, uh, gives you, uh, uh, in a per second, gives you one write unit. And then uh, you can have millions of those write units depending on your application need. And so with that, uh, we charge um, 0.6 and a half cents per 10 writes, okay? And then, uh, then for reads, uh, you, we'll, we'll talk about the different types of reads, but for the, for the strongly consistent read, you get six and a half cents per hour for 10 read capacity units, and the read capacity units uh, are four kilobytes. Okay, and so uh, a, a pricing example, basically, uh, if you wanna do a million writes, uh, you divide, do all the math here, you get to about 12 write units. And so uh, assuming that your writes are, uh, are spread throughout, with the writes and the reads and a, say, three gigabyte storage, you can get uh, this provision DynamoDB capacity for about $7.50 a month uh, managed for you. Um, uh, it changes if you, if you have spikes in reads and you need to change your provision throughput for higher at less, but that gives you uh, a, a little bit of an example. And the writes are consistent. So we also offer the atomic increment and decrement so you don't have to keep doing sums or counts. Uh, you can uh, do an atomic increment or decrement of a particular value. Um, then also we support optimistic concurrency control. So it won't do a write unless a value is retrieved correctly. Uh, if a condition is met, then it will do a write. And this allows for uh, not having to lock any uh, cells or fields. And then transactions. So the transactions are item level. Uh, and then the puts and updates and deletes are atomic consistent uh, uh, and durable. And then the read throughput. So we have the concept of strongly consistent and eventually consistent. So because we're in multiple data centers, when you put in a write, we put the two writes and we commit. But when we do a read, if you need something strongly consistent read, uh, then we make sure that all, all the data has been updated. Uh, but if it's like a Twitter uh, post that you wanna retrieve or something that's not uh, uh, deterministic that you need within one second right back, uh, to wait for the writes to pop, propagate, then you can uh, do an eventually consistent read and be able to pay uh, half as much for your read capacity. So you basically have the same or double the read capacity if you want it eventually consistent, okay? And so the three decisions and then the five clicks ready to use. So you, uh, you create a table uh, this is an example of creating, say, a photos table. And then with the photos table, you can decide here the hash and range or the hash key. And so with the, uh, here, we'll just create a hash, uh, call it a type string. You can do number and binary. And then the hash attribute type, uh, we'll just call ID, okay? And then we'll click through there. And then this is the newest option that we offered. And that is the uh, secondary indices. So right now, it's indexed by the primary key, uh, but then you can decide, well, there may be a non-primary key attribute that I want to index off of, and because of that, we allow for five local indices uh, to be able to do. So that uh, basically, behind the scenes, we've got another series of tables that allow you, uh, when you do this, you have to do it at creation time, is creating these secondary indices so that, um, uh, then you can key off that. So if you had, um, it, maybe you bought an item and you have the order ID as the primary key and maybe the date as the range key, you could have another key as like um, the items that were purchased in that uh, order, right? And then you maybe you wanted to do a query on, well, what, of this item, how many orders uh, w w was this item in? Well, what you would wanna do is use that secondary index of the uh, item ID. And then the provisioned throughput capacity. So we have the read capacities and the write capacities and you can uh, change them. And so the way that works is you can up your provisioned uh, capacity uh, as many times as you want 
uh, and then you can decrease your capacity one time per day. And then it resets at uh, 12 o'clock AM GMT. And then you can do another down uh, to be able to provision that. And then uh, throughput alarms. So you can set, get sent a notification when your capacities have reached a certain level, say 80% of my throughput. So I've said if I want 100 reads per second and the reads are hitting 80 uh, or 90 for over a 60 minute period, then I'll get an email. And it's using our simple notification service so you can get alerts. Uh, those alerts can come to a person, but they can also go to a machine or to auto scaling so that you maybe want to upswing your provision capacity if you start hitting that higher capacity. This is where you can start doing a lot of that automation where based on your business logic and your rules, you can increase your capacity as you see fit uh, based on, on, on metrics or throughput. And then you review, uh, you, you review your table and then hit create. And, um, and then you're ready to go. And so that table is created. Uh, you had the three decisions that we talked about, about the provision capacity and the, deciding on your keys, if you wanted local indices. And then w um, you can do it with the wizard with the five clicks, or you can do it with an API call, and you're ready for use. Uh, this gives you a little PHP example of being able to creating a table name that's called a product catalog. Uh, we have a hash key. Uh, where well, the attribute name is ID and the type is a number type. So, we're, uh, so we give it a type of number, right? You can be number, binary, or string. And then your provision throughput. Uh, you're saying I want to be able to do 10, write, uh, 10 writes per second, basically. And then uh, five of oh, 10 reads per second and five writes per second. So again, with, with that, you're ready for development really quickly. Uh, you can be ready for production, and you can be ready for scale. So, uh, so if you need to jump up in numbers, then you just change those reads and writes to higher numbers, right? With that API call, just update it. Um, and then, so this is uh, going through the wizard and saying, well, instead of ten, let's uh, throw in twenty for each. Then authentication, we do session based to minimize latency. Um, it uses our Amazon security token service. When you get a credential, uh, it's ephemeral for uh, a certain amount of time, and it has a policy of what you're able to do in terms of the API. Um, and we'll go through the API. It's a very pretty, a pretty simple API to go through. Okay? Um, but that's all handled under the scenes if you use our Amazon SDK, uh, which uh, does the, the, uh, uh, the grabbing of the uh, token uh, using your credential and providing the token that you would use to request uh, an action on Dynamo. And then it also integrates with IAM, so if you already have policies designed in your IAM service, uh, you can just apply those uh, for the STS tokens. And monitoring, so that leverages our CloudWatch. So our CloudWatch is our durable store of rolling 14-day store of metrics. And so with Dynamo, you can check what your read uh, capacity has been utilized, which your write capacity has been utilized, or set up the, uh, the alarms so that based on what you'd like to trigger off of, uh, you can get notified or take certain automated actions depending on what happens, right? And so you get notified of maybe you're getting throttled. So maybe you set 10 or 20 reads per second, but now you're asking uh, based on the amount of data that you're retrieving or getting, um, it's more than the 10 uh, or the 20. And because of that, uh, it's going to throw up some throttling metrics that you can uh, key off of. And then there's this whole ecosystem. Amazon's a very open framework, REST and SOAP, uh, RESTful and SOAP uh, a web service type, so that there's all these other frameworks that leverage our SDK or create their own uh, libraries. Uh, it's hard to see there. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll post these slides. That's just a, a, a shortcut to uh, Jeff Barr, our chief technical evangelist. He has a blog, aws.typepad.com. And then in that blog, he has a blog post that shows uh, a lot of these different libraries. Um, and if I have good internet and I don't screw up, uh, I'll have a very simple demo of using Python Bado library to do DynamoDB actions. All right, so uh, no schema. Uh, tables don't, uh, they don't need a formal schema. Um, items are an arbitrary sized hash. Uh, we'll talk about limits, but uh, you just need to specify what that primary key is and if it's a uh, hash or a hash and range. 
All right, so programming DynamoDB, it's small, but it's very easy. Um, the whole program interface uh, can be described in one slide. That's it, 13 API calls, all right? These here are for the tables, right? Creating, updating, deleting, describing the tables that are there. And then here, you can query specific items within a table or scan the full table, but you only get back a maximum of one meg per call, so you have to do multiple calls or page calls if you need to do a large, large types of scan. Um, when you do those, if you do a scan, you want to be careful that you don't max out your read throughput. Um, then put items, so at the item level, putting, getting, updating those items, deleting them. And then you can do batch uh, items, also uh, at, at, to a one megabyte um, size, uh, being able to um, do a bulk update. And then query patterns. So if you use the range and uh, the hash and range composite key as your primary key, um, you can do predicates here. You can do equals, less than, greater than, greater than, or equal to, begins with, uh, right, uh, in between. You can do counts. You can retrieve the top end values or the bottom end values. Uh, and uh, you can do page responses. So basically, you get a page token so that you can then go retrieve the next set of results and, and, and iterate off that. And there's uh, some modeling patterns when using Dynamo. Uh, you, wanna, uh, you can map relation, mapping relationships with range keys. So there's no cross table joins. That's what you lose when you're using a managed NoSQL for us, is that you're not doing complex ser uh, SQL transactions. Um, there are a series of key value pairs, right? But then you can create as many tables um, with as many keys as you need. Uh, uh, based on because you have so many tables and you can model those kinds of relationships. So you have a, if you have an order ID, you have uh, ordered ID here, then you have a range key as the date, and those taken together as your primary key, and then you can have um, zero more of these filled in. So here, this particular set of items in this order, there was uh, two items, here there was only one. And then handling large items. So there's some best practices if you want to handle large items. Maybe, maybe you're trying to log in a bunch of emails and you are put it in a DynamoDB table or some other message, right? You can have unlimited attributes in a given item, and you can have unlimited number of items, but if you aggregate all the key value pairs uh, plus 100 bytes for overhead per item, that total size is 64 kilobytes. So you get one item, as many key value pairs as you want, but if you add that all up, it's gotta be uh, 64 kilobytes or less, okay? But then this is what you need to do if you have objects larger than 64K. All right, you can um, do a range and hash, or hash and range. So your hash key would be, say, your message ID, your range would be what your part number is, right? And then taken together, you can construct all the parts. And so for the message here, you've got this message, um, that, but you ran out of your 64K, so you create a new item, but the hash is still the same message ID, but the range has been upticked, and now you've got the next part of the body, and so on and so forth until you're done. So you can break down that message. I always forget to do that. I always forget to turn off my Evernote when I give a presentation, sorry. Um, so here, uh, it, another example, um, you could have where you're having multiple tables, and then you've, you're, you're uh, hashing on the uh, unique identifier, and then you have the part, and then and do the body continues. And then I also uh, talked to you about before is um, using S3 and Dynamo. So what you do is, if you've got a large one meg file or a terabyte file, three terabyte file or something. You don't have to put all that, break all that out and put it in Dynamo. What you can do is um, you can just have a reference here and just put a pointer in Dynamo to the rest of the object in S3, okay? S3 is also a key value pair. The key is your, your bucket name and namespace and the value is your object blob. And so you're basically using a combination of a, a NoSQL, highly uh, fast, seamless scalability metadata store, and then you're using the highly available, highly durable object store to store the rest of that information. And then this was, is brand new, is managing secondary indices. Um, you can have five of those. 
um, you use a different range key. So you come up with a primary key of a uh, hash and a range. But then for your local secondary indices, you can have five of those. You have to pick another non-key attribute to be uh, the new index. Okay? And so that can give you fast queries. And I gave you one of those examples. And then time series data. So you, you may have, uh, based, say, on logging or clicking through websites, ad views, gameplay, any other thing you want to do analytics on, um, uh, you, you may have non-uniform access patterns. So here, you've got hot and cold tables. So you may have a table for January, uh, you, know, you know, eight months ago, and you may have a table now. So you want to maybe jack up the rate of the high reads and throughputs here uh, that's happening today, or today in August, um, and then reduce those uh, to, to very minimal levels for January, and just do a rolling log, and then output the uh, our old archives into S3. Um, and so, what I like to get to real quick, I only have five minutes left, is then you can use DynamoDB as part of your data pipeline, big data pipeline strategy. You've got your metadata here. You can use any kind of apps to access DynamoDB, putting in all those key value pairs. You can use Elastic Ma uh, MapReduce, which is our managed Hadoop offering on EC2, to, uh, uh, to basically uh, uh, use between DynamoDB and S3, uh, creating um, uh, ETL or analytics, anything, and pump that data into Dynamo and put the resulting information into S3. You can then use Redshift. Redshift is our managed data warehouses as a service. You can have a cluster of instances to give you 1.6 petabytes of data. Um, but this is now SQL compliant, which then can uh, fit with your reporting and business intelligence tools. Because most BI tools and analytics tools today leverage uh, SQL endpoints. So you can have this workflow that use DynamoDB in a NoSQL format, uh, do your ETL and analytics or pre-staging um, into uh, Amazon S3, and then that Redshift can copy either for Dynamo uh, or from S3 and provide that staging area for reporting. Um, it's pretty easy. Basically, you copy the Redshift table from the DynamoDB table, you provide your credentials. Uh, we have a lot of um, different users, and uh, it's, it's our second fastest growing service. It was our first, uh, 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 it was our first fastest growing service until we launched Redshift, and then Redshift became highly popular. But DynamoDB has been very uh, popular and, and well used by large Fortune 500 enterprises as well as government. Um, I'll show you just a very simple example. Um, I'm logged into an EC2 instance. And what I have here is I have a DynamoDB table um, called hotels, and then we'll explore this table. And I, I've got three hotels. I've got Hilton, New York, um, Alos Cupertino, if you guys can read it, I'll read it out, and Sheridan Fisherman's Wharf Hotel. And then I've got a secondary key or, or a range key of the main phone number and city and state, okay? And so what I'm going to do is just show you really quick using, um, this is, uh, I'm using Bado, which is a library for Python. And uh, I'm going to create a connection object. Uh, I've already created the table, so all I want to do is add a new entry. So I'm going to add the local hotel here, uh, the Marriott. So the table's called Hotels. And then we've got San Jose uh, as the city and state, California. And then so I, I create this item, table item. And I say the hash key, which is already known to be the name, is the San Jose Marriott, and the range key is the phone number, and the attributes are uh, the city and state. Okay, and then I do an item dot put as the uh, commit. Okay, that's doing the add item, and so I'll run the Python code, and when I run it, I'll go to here and just hit go, and now you can see where the San Jose Marriott. Uh, ran in. So you can just extrapolate from there. You've got lots of key value pairs. Um, you, you can then automate just putting those in and out as you see fit. Um, Amazon's 100% API, so what you can see me do in the console, you can automate and script in Python, PHP, Ruby, Perl, uh, 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 dot .NET. Okay? Um, so I think that hits our time. Um, I'll take any questions uh, out in the hallway. We have, I think, a coffee break right now. But appreciate your time and interest in learning about Amazon DynamoDB. Thank you.